Good morning from Los Angeles, California, where this morning the sun came out and is poking through cloudy skies that are laced with a lot of smoke. Uh, this is Remote Control. I'm Jim Chabin from AIS. And this morning, I'm joined by our chairman from Google, Buzz Hayes. Buzz, good morning. Good morning, Jim. Welcome. Um, we look like we're in different locations. We're actually in the same studio location, but we're practicing safe production distancing here as we present our uh, remote control conference today from Glendale. We are thrilled Hi. to Hi. to see people joining us from uh, Brazil and London and Puerto Rico and Mexico and San Francisco and Fort Collins, Colorado, and New Mexico, and Boston, and New York, So, and London. Welcome all. We're absolutely thrilled that you could join us. It's great that we've got people from all over the planet at this point joining us. And we'd like to make this an interactive session. So during the conference, there's a chat that you see on the screen, and we'd love for you to submit questions uh, as they come to mind. And we will address those questions at the end of the presentations. We'll have a proper Q&A period after that. Uh, so please enter your questions in the chat as you think of those, and we'll get to as many as we can. And then also, we have a couple of polls that we wanted to put out there to talk to you about to get some uh, opinions on a couple of key subjects. Um, so when you see the polls on your screen, please feel free to contribute, and we will uh, tabulate those results and talk about that after. One of the questions that we're going to ask this morning, and, and I'll ask you, uh, Buzz, um, in the course of your career, um, have you ever seen anything disrupt your career like this has? No, nothing at all. Um, this has been an interesting time, but it's also a time for us to think about how we can actually get back together creatively, even if we can't get back together physically. And I think it's a really interesting opportunity uh, to rethink a little bit about the process. We've been using the same process for making movies and TV shows for a very, very long time. And some of it is worth actually reevaluating. So if nothing else, we can come out of this with a, a, a newer and better approach, perhaps. Uh, you work at Google Cloud. You're the head of media and entertainment. You're the global lead for the media entertainment space. Um, how busy are you during this period? What's happening at Google? Quite busy, you know, and the main thing we we're trying to focus on initially was to get people back to work remotely. But then beyond that, it's really figuring out new ways for people to feel like they're collaborating because we deal with a creative medium. And in this creative medium, it really requires lots of decision making all day long. We used to be able to tug on someone's shirt sleeve and say, hey, what if we tried this or if we move the light over there or set the camera over here? And the times are different now. So we have to find better ways to collaborate than just video conferences. Uh, we have to find better ways for people to feel like they're actually back in collaboration mode. So that's probably one of the biggest challenges that we're dealing with right now at Google. We've got uh, greetings from Malaysia. Uh, we have uh, Bollywood, someone checking in from Mumbai. Uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan, good morning, Michigan. Um, Buzz, we've got uh, four weeks of, of conference sessions. Rather than doing an entire day, uh, we decided to make these bite-sized chunks and 90-minute uh, sections beginning today. Next Thursday, we'll have um, uh, a group from ILM, Bebop Tech, Dave Ward, CEO of Fabric, and uh, Eric Iverson, who's the new CTO of Amazon Web Services, will be joining us. So, um, and then uh, the team from Discovery Networks on how they migrated their channels uh, creatively up into the cr uh, cloud. That'll be next Thursday. So we've got four Thursdays of content. And uh, today we're going to be talking about Matt Workman and the producer skills. So it's going to be fun as people uh, move in here. And uh, Minneapolis is here this morning. Good morning. And Washington State. I hope uh, we see the sun this morning. I hope you can see the sun up in um, Washington. Uh, I know that uh, the whole West Coast has been, um, um, you know, covered in, in, in the fog of an orange smoke. So our hearts are with you guys up the coast. Um, fantastic. Los Angeles is checking in. Miami. Good morning, Miami. Thrilled that you could... Well, you guys, you guys are underwater. <laughs> Welcome to the Calamity Remote Control uh, Podcast. Um, well, fantastic. Uh, it's great. Sacramento is here this morning. Uh, Mumbai, India. Fantastic. You know, um, yeah, we would typically uh, host this event at Paramount Studios or Disney or, or uh, your campus at Google. So it's kind of cool to be bringing everybody together here. Uh, from uh, Canada, Canada's checking in. Houston, Texas, y'all. 
Hey, Texas. Hey, Argentina. That's really nice. Um, anyway, it's great to have you. This is about a 90 minute uh, program here today. We're going to switch to Boston Live and then we're going to go to Vancouver where uh, Christina Lee Storm is working on a movie. They start principal production in a couple of weeks up in um, Canada. So she'll give us an idea of how things are moving along in uh, the Canadian production community. And, um, and we'll go from there. So everybody's coming in. It's Madrid, Spain, Las Vegas, Norway. Well, fantastic. Uh, this is just, just terrific. We are the world this morning. We're just thrilled. So um, you can you go. Just join go us. Please remember, uh, we have a chat going. And if you have questions during the presentation, please enter them in the chat. We'd be happy to answer those in the Q&A session. But welcome from all over the place. Yeah, planet. yeah. Toronto checking in. Hey, Toronto, is it cool up there yet? Is it turning cold? Are the leaves turning? Um, Culver City. Hello, Culver City. So, um, yeah, fantastic. And uh, we this new platform from Meetmo has been developed by one of our member companies. We wanted to do some things that we didn't think were quite possible with Zoom. And so uh, today we just wanted to get the basic show done for you. But beginning next Thursday, we'll start rolling out some really cool features that this, uh, that this platform can do. Uh, because all of us work in the creative space and we need good pictures and we want some flexibility. Uh, we're trying to develop this platform for everybody so you can see and experience and look at things that you probably wouldn't be able to see on a Zoom call. So um, terrific. And Buzz, you uh, look like you're right in front of the control room there. Yes, indeed. Right behind me is uh, Control Central here. And uh, that's where all the magic is happening today. Um, as we bring in our guests from various parts of the, of the North American continent today. And um, so uh, we, we have an amazing team that's working all around us here in a very safe, socially distanced production environment, which is something yeah. that we'll also be talking about uh, over the course of the next four weeks. To walk, to walk onto the stage yesterday and see actual human beings, everybody in masks, everybody at a distance, but it was so nice to walk into a workspace and see other human beings smiling back over their masks. Um, the, other, the other point about our production team is they're working on this show for us today, and then they are going uh, to work on the Emmys telecast this weekend, my old job. So uh, uh, thank you to the great team that are behind the scenes producing our show. And if you watch the Emmys uh, this weekend, you'll see them behind the scenes there making it look great for television uh, for everybody. Again, for the folks that are just joining, um, welcome. We've got folks coming in from all over the world. And uh, as I mentioned, we also have a couple of polls that we're gonna be posting on the, uh, the presentation screen here later on. So we'd love to get your feedback on these poll questions. We have two of them today. And also as you have questions, again, uh, during the presentations, please enter them in the chat and we'll select a few questions for the Q&A period afterwards to cover with our presenters. So again, really appreciate all of you being here today. And uh, we hope you enjoy uh, our remote control conference. And uh, we'd love to hear uh, how you think it's going. So please keep in touch in the chat. We're, yeah, we're all, we're learning this together. Uh, we started this conversation several months ago. Hello, uh, hello, Indonesia. Hi, Germany. Uh, guten Tag uh, to our friends in Germany. Oh, welcome. And Indonesia, that's terrific. New York City, good morning, Big Apple. Uh, I understand that you could see the smoke from California up in New York yesterday, which is kind of horrifying. Um, but um, anyway, uh, Amsterdam, fantastic. France, uh, Colombia, man, we could uh, we could create the uh, we should get the music from We Are the World and uh, do a sing along. <laughs> uh, Buzz, if the uh, if the if the production community can get back to work, um, do you think uh, what's happening right now is forever going to change um, the way all of us create content? I do. Uh, in some sense, it's going to change uh, how we collaborate as teams, and it will certainly change certain aspects of production. You know, when you think about post-production, 
it's a fairly isolated experience in a lot of cases. You've got editorial going on and post-production and other aspects that have happened with a much smaller crew. You really have the whole brain trust together during production. And that's the part that's really going to change the most fundamentally, at least now. And we'll see how that changes. But with new production technologies like virtual production, which we'll be talking about today, that's really going to fundamentally trans uh, transform how we make movies. And um, it'll be a question of you know when people can actually get back together on set and make that all work but we're we're making incredible strides in that and we'll find out about a lot of these great solutions starting today well the 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 good news is and we're hearing this from everybody is that the minute we're kind of through this and we'll be talking about you'll be actually seeing how they're working on set here uh, at, at our second producers guild session today but the pent-up demand for production is so big that if we can get, <clears throat> if we can figure out and get everybody back into a work environment, uh, there's going to be a lot of work because a lot of a lot of shows um, have got to be finished because all these services uh, have got billions of viewers that are paying subscription fees and want to see uh, great content. So that's the good news for us. Great. Well, shall we get started? We shall. Uh, we are just about a minute away. Thanks for joining us. Stand by, and we'll start here very shortly. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. My name is Buzz Hayes. I'm from Google, and I'm the chairman of the Advanced Imaging Society. Uh, for those of you who have, are familiar with the Advanced Imaging Society, we've been having a fall conference for the past number of years in different locations. We uh, started it uh, at uh, Paramount Pictures, and we had the last two years at Google. But this is a different time, and uh, 2020 is not your average fall conference. So uh, the industry itself is changing, and the AIS is changing to meet that. Um, so I'd like to welcome all of you to Remote Control. Um, it's a series of 90-minute conversations over the next four weeks uh, on Thursdays that will help us understand how we can best get back to work and, most importantly, how we can get back to collaborating creatively as we're making content. Um, so uh, I hope you bear with us through our technical challenges. We're doing some uh, pretty groundbreaking things here in terms of being able to present uh, from various parts of the world. And uh, we feel very strongly that it's part of our mission to really keep all of us connected. So throughout the course of the next four Thursdays, uh, encourage you to tune in and to ask questions in the chat and, um, and participate in our polls. And we can uh, keep this as an interactive conference as possible. So um, one benefit of being remote is that today we have people joining us from all over the place. We've got uh, guests from Boston, Massachusetts, from the San Francisco Bay Area, from Vancouver, Canada, from London, England, the EU, New Zealand, and Bollywood. And the sessions are going to be recorded so you can view and share them later, and we encourage you to do so. Um, please engage with us again via the chat. And... Um, one of the first things we wanted to do was put a poll up on the screen for you. And the poll is related to how, how soon do you think movie theaters will be open for first run releases in all the major US markets, including New York and LA? There's a lot of conversation about that, but we're really curious about your opinion on that. So please chime in on the poll when you see it on the screen. And uh, you have some options in the poll to select. So we will share the answers from those polls a little bit later this morning. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsors, uh, Gary Radburn and Matt Allard at Dell, Rick Champagne at NVIDIA, uh, the Producers Guild of America, the Visual Effects Society of America, the American Society of Cinematographers, and Computer Graphics World. And we'd also like to thank Meetmo, our conference platform that we're using here today. Welcome to the meetmo.io platform. As Jim mentioned, we'll be starting to explore some of those features uh, throughout this conference. And we'll be showing some very cool things on the, this remote collaboration platform over the next four weeks. So thank you very much to the Meetmo production team here. Um, now, uh, today we're going to have a couple of presentations. The first is going to be by Matt Workman, who's joining us virtually from potentially the coolest home office you've ever seen. Uh, he'll be talking about virtual production on a budget. And then our second session will be from the Producers Guild of America. That will be a producer's view on virtual production, techniques, capabilities, planning, and budgeting. So without further ado, let's get started with today's program. I'd like to introduce Matt Workman. 
who for many of you needs no introduction. Uh, he's uh, had an illustrious career in uh, computer graphics. Uh, he started his career making music videos for the likes of uh, Justin Bieber and 50 Cent and Diddy for MTV. He's done a number of commercials that I'm sure you've all seen that have uh, been for various large companies, including Facebook, Google, BMW, and L'Oreal. And he specializes in technical cinematography, pre-visualization, motion control, and heavy VFX. So uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Matt. Make sure that during his presentation, you're entering your questions in the chat and we will uh, pick up that Q&A afterwards. So welcome from Boston, Massachusetts. Matt, how are you this morning? Pretty good, thanks for having me. That's great. Well, we're really pleased to be here. Um, so uh, you've got a, a few things to show us today and um, uh, feel free to, to uh, embellish it. I think we have a fairly technical crowd here, so uh, you, you can you can dig deep on this one, all right? But we really appreciate your being here with us and I uh, uh, hope everyone enjoys this. And again, please enter your questions in the chat and we'll get to those in a little bit. So uh, without further ado, Matt, take it away. Awesome, so welcome to my virtual studio. Uh, today, I'm going to be doing a couple demos of the work that I do here that is on the indie side of the spectrum. Although it is a little bit to spin it up, it is something that I think most people could at least work towards and do possibly in their smaller studio or their house. So the first thing uh, we're gonna be looking at is why I have this green screen down here. We're gonna be looking at some mixed reality virtual production. So that means using live action footage from the camera that I am filming this with. Uh, and matching that to a live rendered 3D world in Unreal Engine and putting those together. So it's kind of like a, a fancy 3D weather report. Uh, but I use my electronic drum, so I'll show you how I do the camera tracking for that and a behind the scenes of what that looks like to set up. After that, I'm going to be getting back into more of my traditional cinematography roots and using tools like the Noto inertia wheels here, normally used to control gimbals or remote heads on cranes. And this sort of hybrid camera that's behind me, and we'll be doing a little bit of handheld camera work and essentially uh, filming in a completely virtual world like I would film in the real world if we were on a live action set. So those are the two things I'm gonna cover in this presentation and looking forward to sharing that with you. Hey, what's up? My name is Matt Workman and welcome to my virtual production studio. We're going to do two demos today. I'm going to show you my mixed reality setup where I use a real world camera and I film myself on a green screen on a drum set. And we do some pretty cool interactive uh, lighting and 3D backgrounds with everything 3D tracked. So excited to show that. And we're also going to film something completely in a virtual world, but we're going to be using a virtual handheld camera, a virtual geared head, and a bunch of other cool hardware that makes filming in a virtual world more like filming in the real world. So let's start with a quick tour of all the equipment here. Uh, for mixed reality, you need a real camera and a real lens, and I'm using the Blackmagic Design Ursa Mini Pro 4.6K G2. And I'm using a standard Canon EF 35mm Prime here, so this is DSLR equipment. This is still fairly indie, not expensive PL lenses uh, just yet. Uh, on the top of this camera, what makes this a virtual production setup is that I'm using something called the Vanishing Point Vector System. And what you'll see of that right now is this little sensor on top of the camera. And what that allows me to do is track the position and rotation of the real world camera and send that back into Unreal Engine. So that's the most important part of making this a virtual production setup. To my right here is my camera cart made by Innovative. This is normally a film industry cart for bringing on set. And that's how I have this set up. That's the way that my mind still works. Uh, my main workstation here is an HP Z8 with a Quadro RTX 8000 in it, so pretty much pretty top of the line for um, getting real-time performance out of Unreal Engine. And I have a 4K monitor here, also HP Z, and this is somewhat special if you're not from the film industry or unique. This is an Atomos Sumo 19 HDR monitor slash recorder, so I can actually hit record on this, which we'll do shortly, and it'll record into ProRes 1080 uh, whatever is on the screen. So that allows me to record all this CG real-time stuff, like it's just footage, there's no rendering frames or, or anything like that. I really like these type of live recording workflows. So let's take a look at the vector tracking system right now. You'll see on my computer I have the vector system online right now, or it's on the monitor. 
And basically now, if I pan and tilt the camera like this, at the right side of the screen, you can see a virtual representation of the camera moving around. And so if I tilt down, you see that it tilts down. If I uh, pan left and right, you'll see that that's being reflected. So that is essentially primarily doing our camera tracking. And uh, the vector system is probably the best indie system out there and is very easy to use compared to some of the uh, other techniques of doing camera tracking. So here we are in Unreal Engine here. This is a little scene that I built, pretty simple, uh, with some custom MIDI integration and uh, a future DMX stuff. But uh, it's a standard 3D scene that I lit myself. And what makes this a virtual production scene is that we have this right here. So I'm going to hit uh, G. And you'll see that we have a 3D camera here. That's what that is, and a view of the actual real world camera with it composited over the uh, 3D camera here. And so if I pan the camera back and forth, uh, you can see that we are tracking the real world camera. And then the 3D camera does the same exact same thing. And we composite those together. And that is what's essential for a virtual production setup like this. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to send the composite of this to my recording monitor so that I can work on this 3D scene while recording and viewing through the camera over here. So I'm going to hit play like this, which full screens it, which is fine, actually. Uh, but I'm going to hit capture. And now I'm sending that video composite live to this monitor here. So again, if I move it back and forth, there's a bit of a delay on that one. Uh, it will be on that monitor itself. So I'm on the drum set now. Awesome. And uh, what I'm going to do is hit record so that we can hear the audio at the same time. And this is how I make these videos. So let's record. And I'm recording on the drum set now. This records the drum set audio. And that monitor is recording the composite. So I'm going to hit the drum for sync. Excellent. So what you'll see is when I hit different drums, different 3D objects happen. And I'm calling this setup neon bars, because that's basically what pops up. So if I hit the symbol here, you'll actually see that we have a foreground object. So I'll do it again. And it is based on how hard I hit the symbol. So we have which drum we hit, where you hit it sometimes, and also how hard you hit the drum. Like that. So I, I'm not hearing it. I'm not going to do an actual drum demo. I'll show you what it looks like. And because I don't have someone at the actual camera, I can't show you the panning and tilting. But I'll show you a clip of what it looks like when you're handheld and it's all put together. So that's what it looks like when you uh, have someone operating the camera handheld, and you play something, and you have all this working at once. It's pretty cool. The last thing that I can show you is that if I turn on this light that's behind me, that's putting white light on me right now, eventually I'm going to connect that to Unreal Engine, and that is going to be able to change color and react based on however I deem fit. Currently, I can just do a simple loop, so I'll turn that on real quick. OK, so now that light, which is an Aperture P300C, so an unreleased uh, LED panel coming out very soon, very affordable uh, for the indie filmmaking market that has full RGB color and programmability. I don't think that's how you say that, but we're going to go with it. And we're going to soon be trying to control it through DMX with Unreal Engine. So uh, what I have in my virtual scene is a pink light kind of spinning in circles that you should be able to see. And it's very asynchronously set up to make it look like um, it is basically being reinforced by this real world light here to make this illusion a little bit stronger. So like that. This isn't a drumming workshop, though, however. Uh, so 
That's going to wrap it up for the demo of the Mixed Reality. Again, we have our real-world camera being tracked, its 3D position. That's all making its way back into Unreal Engine. We have a 3D scene that is then reacting to, in this case, the drums that I'm playing with a real-world light attempting to match the lighting in the virtual world put together. So that's a fairly simple setup, but I'm going to keep expanding on this Mixed Reality setup and making videos. This project, again, is called Drummer XR. Hello and welcome to the second part of this demo. I've reconfigured my workstation and now we're going to film something completely in a virtual world using some traditional filmmaking tools and techniques. And remember, this is all real time. It's being recorded to the monitor right now. So there's no rendering after this. We just have ProRes footage. And that's part of the speed and fluidness of this type of a workflow. So this is a project that I did with a company called Super Alloy. We did a remote motion capture, capture session where they were wearing to mocap suits, and I was on a Zoom call and kind of help oversee the action that was recorded for this kind of action film that we're creating here. So that's where the action came from and the motion. And the set was created by Cassidy, who is an art department guild, IATC 800, I believe, um, set decorator, set designer rather, in the film industry. He designed this set for us in Unreal Engine because the art department is starting to work in Unreal, Unreal Engine quite a bit, virtual art department. Whole nother topic. Anyway, let's look at the filming that we can do here. So with this Xbox controller, I can move around like this, move around the actors. And that's going to kind of work like our virtual dolly. But when it comes to panning and tilting the head, that's what the Noto inertia wheels are for. So this is how traditional camera operators like to work, DPs. And if you're using a remote head or gimbals or anything like that, you should be pretty used to this. Uh, from a filmmaking point of view, and we have that exact same control here, comfort familiarity for the actual camera department. We have that same functionality right here, very smooth. Again, the inertia wheel is designed specifically for virtual production, and they feel really smooth. So they allow us to move around. So again, Xbox controller moves us the dolly around, and this does our pan and tilt. So what if we want to change some of the lighting? We have it mostly uh, designed for the scene, but what I can do here is I can raise the amount of fill in this scene essentially. So this is kind of controlling the contrast ratio. So I can make it very dark and kind of unnatural looking, but I'll bring it up to somewhere like this. And I can actually change the HUD that will show us here. So at the bottom right, it shows the sky brightness, essentially. So this is bringing it up to something like this level is pretty good. And we can also change the direction of the sun, because you need to be able to change that per shot. It's unlikely that one lighting setup would work for everything. Just like on set, we change this per shot, and we make it very easy. You could definitely hand over this controller down here, which is made by Monogram, to the virtual gaffer. And you could have multiple people doing this. Or like me, you could do it all at once yourself. Just takes a little bit longer. So very importantly, how do we get the people to move? Again, on the Monogram controller, I have a jog dial here that will spin us through the mocap take. And I can decide, hey, I want to pick up the scene from here, for instance. Or I can go like this, hit play. And there's the shot, and I'm live operating it. Now, that was not a good shot, but it's just to show that, hey, we can move the camera, of course, live while doing a take. So that's the general way that this type of virtual production works. It could be used for a high-end previs, or it could be used for uh, something like in The Lion King, where you have a preview, and you have the director and the DP finding shots together. Or if you did it, did it well enough, uh, I think this is close to that, this could be final pixel. This could actually be the footage that you use for the final product. Uh, when I'm filming this, I'm usually doing it remotely. I'm here in my studio. The director's in Las Vegas, producer in LA, uh, artists in Europe. And we're all in a Zoom call, but we'll all be watching the same filmmaking here. Um, and so it's a distributed workflow potentially as well. Or you could all be in the same studio together at the same time. So I'm moving the sun here. I'm going to try to do one shot. We can also, I just want to show this, we can also move the actors around the scene very, very easily like that. I'm going to scroll it back to where the flip is and just do a shot of the guy for one last uh, demo here. And I'll show you that we can actually go handheld fairly easily as well. So I'm going to come around this way like this and let's switch to handheld. So one second, I'm going to switch. So what we have here is a Vive controller that's being tracked by the sensors around me. And this allows me to control the camera by going handheld. So this is uh, one of the other ways that a lot of filmmakers like to work. And I'm just going to move around the virtual dolly, so to speak, to get a view of this that looks good. 
something like this. And again, re remember, we're recording the whole time. This is not an expensive rendering time process. I can just roll the whole thing and just have a lot of footage. Or you can cut in between either way. So I'm zooming in here, changing the focal length. Uh, let's check who's in focus. OK, so the guy's in focus now. I'll try to make that more clear like this. So you can see that the robot's out of focus, and then he's in focus. That's being tracked automatically. And let's see, I'm going to pull to like something like this. And it's cool. I can kind of like scrub through and be like, OK, is this going to work like that? That looks like it'll be OK, right? So I'm going to scrub back to here, give myself a little bit of lead time, and I'll operate the shot handheld. And play. Waiting for the warm-up phase, giving the handheld a little bit of work. So he's running at 0.5 speed as well. And there's the flip and a little bit of handheld action at the same time. So the last thing I want to show as well is that we have uh, full, t uh, c full control of the time. So if I bring it back to one speed like this, this is playing back in real time. Boom, gravity looks normal. But uh, depending on the director, uh, what they want, we can also change the speed to something very, very slow like this, which is like, I'm going to have to go to like here and hit play. So this is 0 0.01 speed. So I'm going to have to just even go faster like this. But you can see that I'm handheld in real time, but he is moving extremely slowly. Like, I think 0 0.01 is too much for this particular shot, so I'll do 0 0.1, right? So here we go. He is moving extremely slowly, but I'm still able to control the camera in real time. And we can even move the lights in real time. And it's a very fast, fun, iterative process to control all of this in real time, no rendering, just see it all right there. Maybe I follow the robot down, and then I go back, and it's a good time. So that concludes the second demo, working completely in a virtual world, but doing it like we're filming on the real world with the roles more or less uh, preserved of director, DP, art department, and you're able to do it remotely as well. And so this is one of my favorite types of virtual production, and I really try to push as hard as I can with the best equipment, hardware-wise, and best lighting that I can get to get this as close as possible to Final Pixel. And I think as the Unreal Engine gets better at rendering and hardware gets even faster and techniques come out that are new that we will definitely be getting like 4K, high resolution, high fidelity final pixels out of this. Or again, in the worst case, it's just really, really good previs or data that could be extracted from it, like say just the camera work or where the lighting is placed for a final render workflow that's more typical to how VFX works at the moment. So that wraps it up for the tour and demo of the Virtual Production Studio. Thank you so much for watching. That was fantastic, Matt. Thank you. And it looks like we have a bunch of questions here on uh, the chat. So uh, why don't we jump right in and answer some of these questions? Um, first question is from Jibs Guy. How do you think visual effects production can relate uh, in previs in a virtual production project or in a TVC project? Starting on the deep in the deep end here. Okay, so I mean, uh, if I if I understand the question, you know, I think that one of the big changes that happens with virtual production, uh, whether it be for LED wall, and I'm assuming this has to do with live action integration, you know. So if we're talking LED wall or green screen, is that we have to move um, a lot of the asset creation up front into what would be typically pre-production. So. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm understanding this correctly, you know, the we're going to see previs and typically post-production or asset creation. That's all coming up front, and it starts it starts to happen really quickly uh, in the process. And I think that you know the the spectrum and the flow chart of when do you do what is is very much evolving and changing so much that I'm not sure that pre and previs, post-vis, that stuff um, is more fluid now, which. I think it's fun, and I, I hope that that means that, uh, especially in a time of working remotely, that the director, the DP, the art department, the virtual art department, um, maybe music editorial, I don't know, like that everyone can um, be more present in that process, whereas in the, your typical pre-production process, there's only certain people that are going to be present during that, and many of the decisions are made later. Uh, but with virtual production, whether that's a more fluid, just previs, or it's really trying to get the virtual art department, everything lined up for an LED wall shoot, uh, I think that we're going to see a lot more people involved uh, earlier on and throughout the process, which I think is a, a very cool part about virtual production. That's great. And you know, along those lines, I think one of the other things that 
people don't necessarily think about when they think about previs and virtual production is the fact that you have a much better sense of what your movie is going to be earlier on before you've actually you know, pulled the trigger and started shooting. So uh, this is a really good opportunity for creatives to get their head around things. It does change the dynamic a little bit. You know, I, I like to tease filmmakers who love to push everything to post to say, you know, if you build all your assets up front and you shoot virtually, then you, what you see is what you get. And there's really nothing wrong with making a decision, you know, as to what your, your sets should look like and what the environment should look like and that sort of thing. So I think there's a lot to be said for previs looking more and more like the movie before you've actually made the movie. I think there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of merit to that. Um, the next question we have is from Antoine. He says, Matt, can you tell us more about your career path? And specifically, how did you get started working in virtual production? Yeah, so uh, when I was very young, I wanted to get into video game production uh, and just work at, at Blizzard and work on like StarCraft and do game cinematics. That was like a huge inspiration. But being East Coast and not as willing to, I think, to go to to the West Coast, there wasn't as much game production. So I got more into traditional VFX and uh, went to college for computer science, computer engineering with the idea to that that's, that's how I thought you would get into visual effects. That I didn't really know of any 3D animation or like artistic uh, routes at the time. So I got into computer science and then went to New York City on some internships and worked at um, Curious Pictures, Digital Mechanism, a bunch of VFX companies. And eventually I made my way onto being on set because they had stages and I would shadow the VFX supervisor. I got a lot of value out of uh, internships in New York City. I'm not sure if it's still like that uh, viable, but I got to be on set and learn a lot. And I, I decided at that point, given that computer graphics were a little slow, there was no Unreal Engine at this point, I don't, I don't believe. And I wanted to be on something a little faster moving. So I got into production and I started working on movies and commercials as an AC and assistant loaders and whatnot. And I started shooting music videos on the side uh, as, a, as a DP. And then really when the DSLR revolution kind of exploded, I was like right there and started to work at uh, MTV and Viacom and shot like hundreds of promos with all the SLRs. And that kind of graduated me into commercials. And at that point, New York City, I started to do a lot of VFX commercials because it's always been my interest is to work on that stuff. And I started to get into previs, working with The Mill in New York and companies like MPC. And started to do previs a lot, like a lot, a lot. You know, I was like, oh, like filmmaking and 3D. Like I've been trying to kind of get to this world for a while. And then I uh, discovered Unreal Engine or they discovered me either way and started to uh, do it in real time. And it finally all clicked together. I was like, okay, now VFX can be fast. It can be like live action. So I, I continue now to chase combining live reactive filmmaking like it's live action, but combine it with graphics and now with Unreal and, and you know, real-time graphics and NVIDIA hardware and whatnot. Like now it is that like kind of perfect combination for me of live action and uh, computer graphics together. That's great. Uh, sounds like an incredible journey that's uh, basically just getting started. <laughs> Um, we've got another question here from Matt Kemper. Uh, he noticed that you do a lot of green screen virtual production and wants to know if there's a particular reason why you're not using uh, live production on LED wall technology. I have done one LED virtual production shoot and that was with Epic Games at SIGGRAPH. Uh, that was lovely. Uh, pre, I was, so early this year, it was a thought to get a studio and it wouldn't be massively difficult for me to get the LED wall. But currently, it's it's just a little bit beyond the scope, given the current situation, to install it, maintain a space, bring actors to it. So for me, for now, the time being, a green screen is much more affordable, fits in a house, doesn't require, like, a, I don't have to, like, tie into my, my house breaker box or, or deal with extremely heavy and, and hot hardware. So. Green screen is something I can do without it like completely destroying my house. And really a lot of the fundamentals are still there. You're still doing camera tracking. I am currently working on having the lights match, um, be triggered by certain events, right? If it's like a time of day change or something like that. So really all the fundamentals are there of camera tracking. Um, honestly, the camera tracking has to be more precise on green screen than an LED wall. Um, in this case, in most cases, and so, you know, when things clean up a little bit, uh, I would love to get my own studio. And I have a lot of things I would love to do with my own LED wall and test, but it's kind of the current state of the world just makes that just a one step too far. So green screen is just a little bit more uh, house friendly. <laughs> 
and family friendly, uh, indeed. So um, now um, we have a question from a fourth year engineering student from France who wants to know if you have any tips on how to get started working uh, in this domain and uh, maybe you know the, the minimal footprint that you can start with and, and, uh, and work from there. Yeah, so you know, get a PC, hopefully, you know, tower. And so if it's an you know, engineering background, I guess really any, I, I think a lot of this comes together when you get Unreal Engine running and you combine it with any tracked camera system. Uh, so in this case, this is a Vive motion controller behind me. You can use really any VR system. And that tracking system allows you to put a camera to it, right? And it's like, that's, this is like the simplest thing you can do. And it's a lot of fun. And you start to move that around. So you learn how Unreal Engine works, how a game engine works in general, and how you would move a camera in real time. And then from there, it's just kind of grows. It's really where, where I started doing this too. Then it turns into like full body motion capture and then different types of sensors. And you just start to be able to bring live data through LiveLink in Unreal, into Unreal Engine and use it. And if you start to go through those um, different protocols, that becomes very valuable. And if you are engineering side, you know the C++ side of it, I know some people you can go work for immediately. Uh, if you can code Unreal Engine C++ and do hardware integrations, uh, it's a very you know low level uh, thing that's very necessary. So you know if you're coming from any other field of specialization into virtual production, it's a good time because say if you're coming from the live lighting industry and you know DMX and Grand MA and ETC Ion and all you know had a map. Uh, lights and design lighting shows, we are doing that in live virtual concerts. So you can come from live events. If you're coming from you know, architecture and like all these different disciplines, basically, if you can get data into Unreal Engine, uh, that's that's pretty much where it starts, in my opinion. For me coming from camera side, I just I, in, I instantly think of like, oh, how do I make a camera move? How do I spin this wheel and it does something? How do I move that? How do I tell the light to turn colors when I need to? And if you're coming from any other discipline, like moving robots or any of that stuff, it's all I can't say all, but a lot of it is applicable uh, in virtual production. And it's just getting that data into a game engine. And then that goes on an LED wall. It becomes a virtual um, set on a green screen. But I would say it's, it's it, the tech, a lot of it revolves around data into a game engine. Great. Um, so we have. it looks like we have a couple of minutes left. Uh, and so I think it might be time to dive straight into the weeds <laughs> with a couple of technical questions. Uh, the first one is from Carlos. And he wants to know, uh, regarding the 3D sensor on the camera, does it need to be at the center of the lens in order to get the parallax right? It does not. So we're talking about um, you know, essentially matching a real world camera. And it's more than just the camera. With the real world camera and the virtual camera, they need to match. Uh, as close as possible for the effect to work, especially on green screen. So there's multiple sensors and multiple ways of tracking movement and rotation, like where is the real world camera? And I showed the vanishing point system in this one. And you can essentially put it anywhere. It is good to keep it somewhat close to like, we'll say the sensor plane for now. And um, But if you do end up offsetting it, you just have to tell the system that, hey, we've moved that sensor this much up, this much over, this much forward. And most systems can handle that. If you're building them yourselves in Unreal Engine, you just have to know how to put a transform offset. Uh, and then from there to go slightly deeper into it, it's not just the sensor plane. That is actually doesn't matter all that much other than it's the kind of like optical center. You're actually looking to track the lens, the optics. Uh, and so there's words like entrance pupil, optical center, depends on like what generation of um, you know optical tracking you want to get into. You actually, the trickiest part is actually mapping a real world lens. Uh, Cause you can have say like a zoom lens like this big, maybe this is like a, a prime. And it's like, where, it, where in this lens is the 3D camera? Where does that go? You call it entrance pupil. And so say it's here, right? In the middle of the lens. If you focus, it actually moves. And if you close down, it moves again. And if you zoom, it really moves. And then you combine that with distortion like this. You have uh, edge shading where like it, it's gonna vignette chromatic aberration, there's even more things that happen. And so that's where the high-end solutions come in. And it's not actually the camera tracking sensor in that case, it's how you're going to map and encode the lens. So focus, iris, zoom, and a couple other things uh, basically allow the higher-end systems, and maybe there'll be indie ones coming out, to accurately track where that actual 3D the camera optical center should be. Uh, and protocols like uh, Cook Eye, uh, LDS, Zeiss, they're kind of like the older generation. That'll give you some of the data, but the the newest up-to-date protocol is Zeiss Extended Data, 
that's in, I believe, CP3s. I might get a set of those. CP3 XD, C and then the Supreme XDs, or just Supremes, and then the Fujinon Premista line. All three of those zooms are encoded with this new data, and it has everything. It has factor calibrated distortions, edge, like, you know, shading has everything in it, and it's one lean will pour out back to the system. So that's the best. So that's a long answer, but those are those are the kind of the factors you're looking at for matching them together. Well, thank you, Matt, and um, uh, I hope that uh, all of you are following Matt on social media. I, I every morning I, I look at the news, but the first thing I do before I look at the news is I look at Matt's feed on Twitter to see what crazy thing he's doing today. So I hope you do the same thing. So please follow Matt; he's doing some amazing work, and um, I want to thank you so much for being here with us today, Matt. It really means a lot to all of us. So thank you. It was a pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right, so uh, now we have the results of our poll. Uh, for those of you who uh, responded to the poll, the question was, how soon do you think movie theaters will be reopening with first run releases? And uh, it was an interesting breakdown here. So um, about 11% felt that theaters would be open by December 1st of this year. 40% believe that March 1st of 2021 is a more likely date. 27% uh, said June of 2021, June 1st of 2021, and 20% said sometime after June of 2021. So thank you for your responses, and um, we'll, we'll see how that goes and see when it's actually safe to go back to the movies. So thank you. And uh, now we have coming up, our next session is from the Producers Guild of America, and it's called the Producers View of Virtual Production. Wait, what are you saying? I'm excited to introduce this panel of truly talented producers who are all experts in virtual production. This will be a fun, informative conversation, and there'll be some time at the end for questions. So um, I'll start with Christina. Christina Lee Storm is the founder of Asher XR, Vice Chair of Diversity and Inclusion for AIS, and is also a PGA New Media Board Delegate. She's an award-winning producer with a unique blend of animation, real-time, and live-action feature producing, working at the cross-section of story and technology. And Christina right now is working on location, so thanks for joining us um, all the way from Vancouver. We also have Catherine Brillhart. Catherine's an award-winning cinematographer and VFX producer. She's currently the executive producer and director of virtual production on the film Ripple Effect, a short R&D film that just recently completed production. The project explores two different LED walls, smart stage workflows, as well as the use of real-time visualization techniques to develop COVID protocols, very timely, and during film planning and production. And finally, John Canning is the executive producer for new media and experiential at Digital Domain and former chair of the PGA New Media Council. He focuses on VFX for any screen, big or small, and has a long history in new and emerging formats for entertainment. So welcome everybody. And uh, I'll let everybody do a brief introduction of themselves, starting with Christina. Thanks. Uh, I also just want to thank AIS uh, and this entire uh, conference. Um, it's a really important topic that we're covering. And um, also want to thank uh, our moderator, Jenny Ogden, and the Producers Guild for um, partnering together. Um, I find it just really fortunate myself to be having a background in um, production. I did a lot of work um, not only um, in features, documentaries, and short form content, but what was interesting was I also had a uh, background and uh, work experience in visual effects at Rhythm and Hughes. Um, from there, it took me to a path to, um, to DreamWorks Animation, where Bonnie Arnold uh, recruited me to come and work at the studio. She was uh, the co-president at the time. And she, um, it was really, really great. It was um, a look into how animation um, is produced. Uh, I started in feature uh, technology um, 
building the pipeline and then also artist management. But then the last few years, I worked as the head of the advanced creative technology team, which was a new um, endeavor for us to look at our IP, look at all of our um, content and see if there's a way to just um, expand it. So expand it in all platforms and all different types of content with AR, VR, XR. So in a very short period of time, when I came onto the group, um, we didn't really have a lot of forward, like um, um, public facing projects, um, but our film, How to Train Your Dragon was coming out, How to Train Your Dragon Hidden World was coming out. And within a very short period of time, we I produced uh, three um, location-based VR projects. Uh, one was uh, I Fly, one uh, which is like you're in VR flying in a wind tunnel. Another was um, uh, a uh, the Hidden World virtual tour, which was a partnership with Positron and, um, and Walmart. And the third was with Dreamscape. And what was neat was those, two of those projects were actually, well, actually one was um, we won the Lumiere from the um, How to Train Your Dragon, the Hidden World virtual tour. Um, after leaving, so what was neat about the advanced creative technology team is that we really thought about the future of content, the future of, of uh, production in terms of utilizing real-time um, game engine. And um, what was really exciting was our um, work with um, real-time digital characters. And um, just really uh, partnering with, with vendors and folks that, that were having this discussion as well. How far can we push it? After leaving DreamWorks, as, as Jenny mentioned, I did um, venture off because there was so much going on in the virtual production space that I started my own um, shingle, uh, Asher XR. And as Jenny mentioned, I am currently on location. I'm producing. I'm producing partners with David Oyelowo, and I we are in uh, uh, heavy pre-production, and we start principal very very soon. So yeah, thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Christina. Um, Catherine, I, I think everybody would love to hear more about your latest production, Ripple. Oh yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me uh, on this panel. I'm so excited to speak about this. So um, Ripple Effect is a unique project. It's um, an industry-backed short film, an R&D project, where we had the chance to test LED smart screen stage workflows uh, we really focused on pushing boundaries for uh, what you could achieve with a pixel in camera. And um, and kind of we wanted to crack open that conversation in a bigger way in the industry. And we're also publishing a white paper of our findings so we can give a little bit more structure for producers and um, directors and creatives who want to put projects like this together. Great. And did you have some slides to show? Yeah, I do. I will share. Awesome. So this uh, this is a wide view of the XR stage that we shot our truck sequences in. The stage is located in Pacoima. Um, we tested out three different unique scenarios for our stakeholders, an interior scene, an exterior scene, and a vehicle uh, sequence. And so the picture that you're seeing right now is um, the, the virtual content that we created, the stage and the truck, right before the crew came on set. Um, there's an image that's kind of behind the scenes of one of the environments that they were driving through. So we have different complexities on this one, rotating the world, rotating the truck, practical elements, wind, finding horizon line, scale, um, really cool. And then this is uh, just quickly a frame that captured through the lens of the camera. Um, kind of stepping forward to our interior dining room scene, it was designed in a way where we could use an LED wall to light and also have a digital background that would show parallax as we move through the scene. Um, we had an added layer of complexity using a material like plexiglass as our clear surface going between the LED wall and uh, our, and our camera lens. So we experienced, you know, more and uh, other complexities like um, dealing with darker, higher contrast content that people might not have 
be exploring with and testing with right now. A um, couple quick images of what it looks like to shoot with COVID safety practices on set. Very interesting. There's the, like a wider shot of where you can see the ceiling in the full room. Um, and here is also uh, an image of what we were able to capture through the camera. This shot is outside of the dining room looking in, which is why you see the reflection of our environment on that plexiglass. Uh, uh, our exterior scene, the battlefield, uh, we shot at Lux Machina down in the Arts District on their test stage. And it created a whole different world of complexities and test cases. Here I would say the big bullet points were matching a practical set in a virtual set you know, from that pre-production process all the way into production and live color grading uh, to get that scene to match, um, how to design for that. And then uh, I would also say from a cinematographer's standpoint, um, architecting your shooting map and your shooting plan to shoot in relatively one direction and rotate the world and the characters to kind of match. So that was sort of an interesting scenario. This is a uh, just another behind the scenes shot of us working together mm -hmm. and a shot from the camera um, during our live feed. And then just to fast forward more, uh, we were really excited to have um, Greg Chacho, who's also an executive producer, head of production and post on the project, set up an amazing remote workflow that uh, helped us through the, every phase of production on this project and depicted here kind of in one image is um, a little slice of what he provided for us. Uh, this shows a live feed from the camera and a live feed from a uh, fish angle surveillance cam of our set so that our stakeholders and anyone working remotely on our project could tune in and engage with us in real time all the time. Um, and then last but not least, as we work through our creative project and case study on this film, in parallel, we developed a COVID safety visualization process and project using a typical real-time like pre-vis tech -vis techniques and photogrammetry uh, with the help of digital film tree, ICVR, and virtual wonders to scan our stages early from the very beginning so that we could not only reuse those assets in our tech -vis process with k Entertainment and ICBR, but we could also uh, create these amazing interactive safety biz um, experiences for production to plan around. Our team collected international data and was able to ingest this data into our COVID planning uh, tool. And we could, and the, the path that we were validating is one where you might be able to generate a COVID safety scenario if you input different information. So this project was in process and helped us along the way. And it's an incredible tool because in addition to this sort of interactive view in real time, um, you can also generate 2D overhead maps that are a producer's best friend when you just need to iterate and you know create a war map or see the data in a different way. So this is very uh, brief, but a, a summary of what we did on the project. Great, thank you. Um, and John, of course, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? I know you're uh, very busy over a digital domain. You've also got an amazing background uh, back from uh, your NBC Universal days and also, I believe you're an advisor on several different technologies. All, all those other things. And hey, Buzz, I saw you pop in. Hey. Um, nice to see you. Hey, everyone. Uh, I, I like to say my job is now visual effects for any screen. Um, since I've come to digital domain and uh, focus on the new media side of things, it's the not film, television, or commercials. Uh, but in reality, it's how we're applying this CG technology, visual effects, uh, to all these other different processes. If you think about the XR world, uh, you think about the game world, everything is increasing in fidelity, resolution, um, and going in real time. And so uh, bringing and leveraging the background that I had in the immersive technologies and, and interactive world of interactive television and, and things like that, 
Um, it's sort of culminating in this moment of real-time production, uh, going to different kinds of screens, and then, of course, layering this thing that we call virtual production on top of it now. And so at DD, we've been spending a lot of time, I and mean, we had to virtualize a studio almost overnight uh, to start working on projects where everybody has to go work remotely. So, you know, for us, it was instantly experiencing these things uh, of suddenly not only are you working on projects remotely, but you have to worry about how your employees are connecting, um, that the cloud-based technologies that uh, were a good idea or interesting ideas suddenly became, let's focus on how do we work with that. Um, and then you get into this aspect of what we call virtual production, which can be simply everything from, well, we can only send a person to a location, so how do we capture that, to uh, the emphasis on pre and setup, to the fact that you know we have a mocap stage, but only so many people can be on that stage at one given time. So the remote access, your your importance of a remote video village uh, becomes even more important when you may have people halfway around the world that need to attend the shoot or make directorial decisions. Um, and then we get into this, how do we create environments? And Catherine's experiment, I couldn't have been more timely um, that project was really the, we now have to go figure this out, right? Where virtual production, the, the idea of using LED walls was interesting and some shows did it and for particular shots, um, a lot of that was, you know, came down to a, well, we don't really need to do this, never done it before, we won't worry about it, to, well, we need to think about how to do this because we have to limit the number of people on a set. We may limit the fact that we can't go somewhere um, all of these things started to play and accelerate this technology. So it's making it a very fascinating time to start being the nexus of this and to see how we can work with this different technology and still get our jobs done. Great. Let's start this off. Christina, can you tell us just a big picture overview? What is virtual production? Yeah, I mean, in simple terms, because a lot of people have been hearing about it, especially when The Mandalorian came out with the behind the scenes and how, you know, how they you the, how they utilize virtual production and so in 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 short it's really really simple um, and then okay let me just also say as we went into um, working from home remotely a lot of people felt that oh I'm working virtually so that's virtual production but for everyone here and everyone on this panel really what we look at is virtual production is utilizing game engine that enables us to see our assets in real time. And so it's um, also another way of looking at it from a producer standpoint is we are literally taking our CG assets, the things that John was talking about, and we're able to bring them on into production and actually see those things um, in real time. And there's a lot of variations in that mix, but when I describe that and the way we also describe Mandalorian, it's basically final pixel. But I want to kind of take a step back real quick and, and describe a few other uh, technologies that have been around for a while, actually, um, that are considered virtual production. And so sort of how I have been describing this um, is there's um, I would call like four main areas. It's there's the visualization part, which includes uh, pitch viz, pre viz, um, location scouting, um, tech viz. Um, stunt viz, post viz. And then we also have the um, second area, which is like the performance capture, the motion capture, facial capture, um, all utilizing virtual production. The third would be like a hybrid, hybrid green screen, um, which we're all like that has been used for a long time in sports and broadcast. And then the fourth, which is what a lot of people are seeing. And I like to call like the 1% <laughs> of virtual production, which is not necessarily a good thing to call it the 1%, but that is the final, the live LED wall, final pixel. And so a lot of uh, conversations are surrounding like, oh, you know, we want to take it there. We want to see that. But I also just employ to my fellow producers that there's a lot of other parts to virtual production that you should really look into because we, of course, want... The, I, we want the, the hope is that everyone has an opportunity to use or leverage virtual production and it doesn't have to end up being the 1% or the final pixel. Yeah, and I think what you said was very important is 
there are different tools and technologies. A, some of this has been around for a while and now kind of getting lumped into the bandwagon of virtual production because that's the cool, hot buzzword, if you will. But it's, it's again, these are all different tools and technologies to hopefully make a production go either more smoothly, to visualize what you need to visualize. Uh, and producers have to constantly remember that a lot of this is interesting, but does it help solve the problem you're trying to achieve? Um, and that's where I think that's the, the back and forth that folks have to have is, uh, you know, how does this tools and technologies play in to what you're trying to produce at the end of the day? Yeah, I absolutely agree with that as well. I think creative is going to drive the tech. And uh, just for anybody who's listening who's got an indie budget or a smaller budget, virtual production can be a piece of your production. It doesn't have to be the entire thing. Maybe there are certain shots where creatively you need to solve certain problems. And just using a Samsung 8K LED monitor is all you need. Maybe just integrating like Black Box Studio products or other uh, you know, products that are accessible um, that are open source and codable to what you need. Um, you can pretty much tailor any of these tools to specific creative demands. Yeah. Awesome. So, Catherine, would you share a little bit more about your experience and how you first became uh, involved in working in virtual production? Sure. Um, I'm a cinematographer, and I would say, I, for me, the beginning of virtual production movement would be the transition from film to digital cinematography, because it allowed you to see in real time dailies. And I think there are other aspects of our industry kind of over history that have been becoming more real time and more digital and more accessible. And all of these different aspects um, are kind of advancing and coming together. So all that to say, um, I got into visual effects early on um, in my career and could start seeing from the post visual effects side and from the digital cinematography side that there was going to be a point where these two things were gonna to come together. And so it really inspired me and got me passionate about exploring visual effects in every angle. And that's kind of how I got into producing and visual effects supervision. And I think developing all of these different skill sets, um, you know, being exposed even in that journey to early on like Zoic Labs, uh, Zeus, type one that Mike Brummy developed, just these little pieces. And then uh, also through my um, involvement with the VES, uh, participating in the ASU's Joint Virtual Production Committee in 2013, just being in a room with all these thought leaders coming from visualization, uh, location, scouting, art department, kind of uh, just being part of this amazing slice of history where the conversations we're all having in one room. So I'm very excited about having the opportunity to uh, guide the mechanics and the, the test case studies for ripple effect um, so that, you know, to kind of continue this conversation with all these departments in the industry. Awesome, perfect. Um, John, I, I know in the past we've had many conversations about the different tools, technologies, and techniques in production, and and really that they're a tool, and it's about what is the best tool to bring your story to life that you're trying to tell. Um, can you describe a little bit more, or drill down a little bit more in the various into the various types of virtual production? Sure. I we started this conversation a little bit earlier where. Uh, you know, if you you think about it now, what we're starting to see is the how do we capture a location, right? You know, traditional scouting. Somebody takes a bunch of pictures, shoots some video. They come back. Maybe everybody, you know, 20 people on a helicopter going from location to location to location. Um, if you think about it now, what we're able to do is even man portable LiDAR units, 360 cameras, being able to go capture a location uh, digitally uh, and potentially at a rough uh, view uh, that comes back and enables a group of people, maybe even in real time and disparate locations, to be able to view that location, decide if they like that location. If we think about capturing that location from the get-go, photogrammetry, LIDAR, then what you're doing is you're able to capture that location. Could be a set, could be a physical location. 
you may have to then build that um, and use that and for whatever you are going to do, whether it's the previs, but potentially now, as we mentioned, into producing final pixel on an LED wall. And so um, then we move into the engines. So a real-time engine like Unity or Unreal, um, where we're able to, you know, they're formally considered a game engine now. I call them real-time engines because we're using them for so many other things other than games as well. Um, but the ability to drop my assets into this environment, be able to manipulate the environment, be able to change the lighting conditions of the environment, um, it becomes almost a dynamic tool set for uh, a previs and into production. But then you're building a, a visualization for, say, this LED wall. And look, I mean, it, it you know, they've run L visualizations on LED walls from simple just video, right? You know, playing out video using a DMX type of system uh, to play video out on there. And the, the classic uh, scenarios are typically car um, or outside windows. Um, you know, Ripple Effect used it in, in very effectively in that way where what you want is a vehicle moving through somewhere, uh, but you may not be able to shoot on that location. Um, you know, you think about uh, using an, a, an LED platform, you could have your sunset last 10 hours. Right? You know, the golden hour is no longer a, we got to catch it at this moment. Um, the drawbacks are, you know, still understanding lensing, uh, the more effect, um, it is not the, you know, the answer to every solution. But what we're looking at is how do we start building digital assets sooner in the process so that we can carry them through. You may at previs have something that's a rough digital asset that you will know you're going to up res and continue to improve because it's eventually going to be on that LED wall as the backdrop. Um, and then moving through that process. Um, and in some cases, some folks are actually using the real-time engines to actually render out final pixel. But what we see it is incorporating that as a tool set into a pipeline uh, we're still using some of, you know, Maya to create some of the initial assets. Um, we're mocapping, uh, but it's the ability to, when you're on a mocap stage, see what you're actually creating. So we drop the environment overlaid in our mocap stage so actors can actually see themselves acting in the environment, moving that through the process. So these are just, you know, some of the tools and techniques we're playing with. Um, and again, what it does to a producer is that it makes the producers think about, you yeah, know, this isn't necessarily about, oh, it's so much cheaper doing it this process. What it's doing is making you think about where you're spending your money. Um, you know, it's where, you know, in if we were shooting in green screen uh, and you may think not worry about what's going to be the thing on the green screen until you get into post. Well, if it's an LED wall, now you have to have that produced. You know, the benefits are the actors get to see what they're acting in as opposed to pretend this green fuzzy tennis ball is a creature and you're in a mountain scene. Um, that can change, that can evolve. Again, the changing of setups, uh, being able to go from night to day, um, some of these things have become a lot of advantage, but it also means you have to think about some of this much earlier in the process. The art and the departments have to work together to create that earlier in the process because you're trying to capture when we say final pixel you're capturing in camera both your actor and potentially that background and you're hoping that, that that's good you're not going to necessarily have to fix that in post so to speak so those are the goals and those are the kinds of things we're talking about as we look at it uh in in the, the virtual production world yeah. great so christina what are the key factors producers should know when considering virtual production um what a really good question. I mean, I would say like 2020 is really all about innovation, uh, curiosity, and creativity. And I think... And safety protocols. And safety. Oh, my gosh, yes. And safety protocol. Um, I think when producers are thinking about virtual production, there's a lot of factors involved. But I, I would say the approach. Let's just start with the approach. The approach should be one, like is my show or my project is it the do i have the right people in place within my group let's say the director and whatnot are they going to be a good fit for virtual production which means um testing things out 
you know, our industry has, is incredible. We've been doing this for so many years. We've been doing it. It's, it's basically tr a traditional production is done in such a way. It's very much set in place. Virtual production is, is not necessarily that. And I think we have to look at it as producers. We look at it from what we know as pre-production, development, pre-production, production, post and distribution. We have to actually meld and knock down those walls of those different departments. I think we have to we have to think of that really holistically and not what they, you know, everyone talks about like throw it over the fence type of thing. So what John's been saying is that what I do is I think about, okay, if I want to take this particular sequence and I want that sequence to be in camera, uh, final camera, final pixel, then I need to know that at the very beginning and start to, to really plan out those assets, start to plan those things out. The other thing that is that I would just um, encourage the producers is your pre-production, you know, um, a lot of people think, you know, in production, that's where I'm going to spend all the money. Everyone's starting, the entire circus is going, all the crew members. And it's actually a little bit different with virtual production. I, you know, you could scoot that over. You could scoot like the, the spend, the amount of money being spent and the people that are coming on. You want a, a, a bit more on, on a earlier, like early pre-production part for concept, for design, for uh, pre-visualization, for visualization, so that you're really jamming on that. And then when you get to production, what happens is, is that it's not so stacked necessarily. Um, so it's a different way of looking at it. But the other thing I would say is also, you know, um, really really leaning in and being brave about the technology it's like this is the new this is the future of film production and folks like Catherine, myself and john and jenny we're here to help usher that in we're here to help create the most collaborative diverse type of uh producers and filmmakers for the future and what's incredible from uh, the other aspect that i would love to talk about is also what john had said about like location scouting, it's a perfect example, right? In today's age, today, with COVID and all the requirements, the safety requirements, you you, not, you might not be able to deploy a team out to an XYZ location. Uh, one is the country opening it up for people, like wherever they're based. And if you can get through to that country, then you have to quarantine. You know, and you're usually going to quarantine for about two weeks. So those two weeks are cost your production. Okay, what we're suggesting and what we're we think that are really smart tools is deploying out a local, uh, you know, lidar team to capture what you want, um, and and sort of create this really um, really strategic and thoughtful uh, remote team working, so that you have your team. Let's say you want to shoot in. Um, in Morocco, you have a team there that's already deployed, capturing, lidaring that, and then you can bring it back in while your your maybe your main team is back in LA or wherever. And um, these things kind of help. The other thing is that you know, in physical production, in traditional production, you're always looking for that location to exist, unless you you know. And, and we know that with the the use of uh, computer graphics, that we've we push the boundaries of that. Virtual production is just allowing that even more so. It's allowing that so that then you now can potentially see that, and it's not it's it's not at the tail end of the pipeline where you're like, oh, okay, so that's what it looks like. Um, and so it's really um, virtual production is designed for a mindset of collaboration where you're going to pull in everyone and have everyone chime in, and we're we're basically paving new roads. And so that's that's what I would encourage uh, producers when they're considering virtual production. I, I have one pro tip, uh, which is if you have Google Earth or the Wander app on like Oculus Quest, you can actually get a you know 3D view of a lot of different locations on the planet and never leave mm -hmm. your own house, right? Like it's not going to go you know get you the the photogrammetry, the LIDAR, but if you're just like literally going, well, we can't go to that location because, you know, there's the quarantine, you can actually pop a, a VR headset on and do a quick visit 
uh, to a location, even on the ground level, be able to spin around at least to get a sense of it. So oh, it's, it's one of those things that's okay. kind of a, uh, I'd say lo-fi, but it's a, it's a way to do scouting or at least an initial quest. And, I, and actually, I just want to add something because we had a cool photogrammetry story on our project. Um, Ryan Argambos, our VP supervisor, scanned our truck early on in the process, like way early on, and then he just did a rough reconstruction, got it going in Sketchfab, and it meant that any department head on our crew could put a scale accurate version of the truck in physical space in their homes where they were designing and kind of walk around with their phone or iPad as a virtual camera to actually scope out the truck. It was like sort of the inverse of what you do in a game engine. And then we were able to actually host a, um, a group in person session at one of our early test phases on XR stage, place that CG truck with the walls behind us and that smart stage and have our DP walk us through their actual shots. Um, that that actual photogrammetry in the, in the uh, sorry asset went all the way onto the screen as an animated asset, but it was really cool to use it in the beginning of our pipeline, like you're describing for anything for virtual scouting through previous techers and final shoot. Awesome. Jenny, I just wanted to jump in for a second. Um, we have some questions on uh, the chat, if you don't mind uh, addressing a couple of questions there. Um, the first question is from Jim asking, how are producers now approaching the budget breakdowns and evolving new positions on the crew, knowing that they're going to spend more upfront on these virtual production shows and projects versus the normal visual, visual effects and post hit at the tail end of a schedule? I mean, I'll, I'll chime in initially on this. I think that's exactly it. You know, it's like, oh, that's going to be visual effects. I think we have to begin to blend those. Um, and it's it's not, it, it's the, it's possibly even like, here's the environment. It's just like a location. Like, I'm going to, I know that this location will cost X amount of dollars. So perhaps it's looking at it from an, an environment standpoint. Like, yeah. we built, you know, you're going to charge this amount, you know, line item this amount. For this particular location environment, um, I, I, break it down. I had a actually a, a, this morning. I had a call with a, a producer who has a series, um, and you know wanted to jump into using a particular kind of technology. And you know, first it was like, okay, what kind of budgets are you looking at per episode? And then thinking, you know, and, and having him walk backwards and say, look. You need to go through your script and look at what you're trying to achieve and then mm -hmm. you know measure up like everything could be a vfx shot everything could be cool and digital do you have that budget what are the necessary things that you you know oh my god we don't know how to do that practically um so you know part of it is is again it's what we've always done where you're breaking down scripts and you're figuring out what your stunts are and and things like that now there's that extra layer of saying, is it a practical location or is it a digital location? Um, the the kinds of folks that you hire, I mean, look, visual effects companies, we're all adapting that. So mm -hmm. it's potential you're going to your VFX company, but you're engaging them even in pre-production saying, okay, some of these shots, instead of having you produce them six months from now, you're going to be produced, you're going to be working on them now. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's again, it's shifting some of that, um, you know, in the, in the, the, but it's, it's, yeah. it's breaking it down and then starting to ask those questions, I think is the, the first step. And I think this is where having a strong creative direction, like a visual, a visual effects producer or that experience and part of the visual effects supervisor up front during the script breakdown process is essential because you do want that creator to drive, to drive some of the choices that you're making about what tools you're gonna to use. Because from a director's point of view, all of the materials and textures and crew and you know all these ingredients that you're using to create this process are going to affect the final look of your image or the feel or um, you know, your creative intent as you move down the pipeline. So the more educated you are on how you want to communicate your vision using these tools and working with producers who are willing to try new things and try new tech and um, that sort of thing will make your project stronger. 
You know, it's interesting you mentioned that because one of the things that we've experienced in the past 20 years of visual effects is a lot of creative decisions have been pushed off to post-production. <laughs> and now we're shifting gears and we're getting back to the way it used to be. You built the set and that was the set you shot on. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's an interesting time where you have, in some cases you consider it a playground. You really get to experiment before you make the movie. But I guess there's probably a little bit of a danger zone there when you get on set and you see these demos of like how easy it is to move that building or that tree or that mountain. And I'm thinking as a producer, is this the right time to be doing that? Or should we have done that a few weeks ago? It's two it's, philosophies, yeah. right? Fix it in prep and fix it in post. Fix and, it in pre-post. Yeah, right. <laughs> you can do it, you can do it, you can do it like a purist and do it either way. Or, you know, you could be a team that's like, hey, let's do a little blend and this is what our blend is. And yep. kind of do a little bit of it. Yeah, I mean, I would just, you know, I, I think it's the it's the time of disruption. So I think, I think it, it shouldn't be. If someone's saying, "Oh, let's just do it this way," that's a traditional flaw. I think I think that's what I'm saying is that it's like, let if you can blur those lines, and then look at it holistically. And and you know, I for me personally, it'd be like, I, I look at it both pragmatically as well as well as very much creatively. And, and, and budgetarily, right? Because we're all facing those budget concerns. So if I know I want this one shot that's supposed to be in Fiji or where, wherever, I'm not going to get that. Let's say I want to shoot that early next year, right? right. We're going to still have the same safety protocols. Those safety protocols are not going away. Mm -hmm. They're not going away. So I will look at the, the holistic project and say, this particular, these particular set pieces, I want to really lean in. And then the other ones, can I still do within the confines of my safety protocol? Um, exactly. And kind of be more creative, again, because there's always gonna be budgetary concerns. And I think then within that play box, that, that sandbox, then, okay, how far can we push it, you know? <laughs> uh, we have time for one more question, and I think you kind of broached this, but I think just to hear from everybody in the panel, if you could talk about any genres or types of shows that would uh, really be able to leverage virtual production um, you know, people think of the bigger budget sci-fi and horror films and things like that, but could you weigh in on the types of production where you see this is headed in the next 18 to 24 months? I, I would say if your project requires a, a large travel someplace, you know, that you're not currently in, let's say, let's just say hypothetically you're based in LA, your team's based in LA, and you want to shoot in... South Africa, or I don't know, um, Australia, New Zealand, uh, and, and get some really outdoor amazing set pieces, I think absolutely that would be, be smart because in order to travel, you don't have to necessarily travel that entire team then over or spin up that. Um, I think there's, there's things that we're facing. Um, it's an overlay also with COVID safety protocols that we have to look at it, not just like, hmm, I want to pick the, I want to pick the best location. You're, we're, we're being uh, forced to make decisions based around safety as well. So. Yeah. I think I, honestly, I've had a lot of, um, a lot of inquiries also for unscripted, um, being able to do some really creative uh, environments for unscripted and competition based t series television um, that, Typically, you wouldn't have the budgets to do that much travel. Doing them in a virtual stage is um, an option that a lot of companies are looking at right now. Yeah, I think it, it episodic where you're you're not wasting the money on one shot, mm -hmm. right? Um, if you can, you know, where you're starting to look at it, um, you know, LED walls are expensive. Um, you've got to build the the visuals. Um, so then what you get into is, can you reuse this? Is it something that's going to be used for different shots over and over and over again? Mm -hmm. uh, so you get into that sort of thinking around it. Um, it's, it, you know, you don't, it, you don't want to sink all the money into that one spectacular shot, but then it's two seconds and you wasted a ton of your, your VFX budget on it. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing is, is experiment, 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 because you will start finding what kind of shots do work, don't work. Um, you know, it's, it's, you don't want to go and, uh, you know, anticipate that you need to zoom in on the, the background, um, that, 
it's an LED wall. Um, that's not going to work so well. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's, it's, there is a bit of the, you know, and, and again, Catherine went through this and everybody that talks about it, the PRG team has got a, an XR stage here and they were like, the methodology and the shooting that we were doing six months ago has changed radically over mm -hmm. time and we learn things. And so it's literally, if you're thinking you want to do this, mm -hmm. um, you go grab people that have done it um, mm -hmm. and start having that conversation because it's going to, it's going to save you pain and anguish. If you're like, I'm just going to go do it. And you spend all the money and the shot doesn't work. Right. Exactly. Well, yeah. Well, I thank you all for your time. We're actually out of time. Uh, apologies. But I do want to thank all of you for being here. Uh, Jenny, thank you for hosting this uh, really interesting panel. Uh, John, Catherine, Christina. Uh, these are the people who are on the front lines of, of virtual production right now. And so it's really important that you keep an eye on what all of these folks are doing because they really are on the, the leading edge of what's happening in virtual production. And it's, hap it's changing every single day. So I really appreciate all of your time here. I know you're all very busy people. Thank you for sharing some of your day with us here at the Remote Control Conference. Hey, thank, you. Thank, thank you very much. Thanks for Advanced Imaging Society for hosting us and, and having the conversation. Yeah, you're very thank welcome. You. Um, we wanted to get back to some uh, poll results here um, from the the, uh, the poll that we put up, the, the second question we put up, which was looking over your personal work history, would you say that this period in time is the most disruptive period of your own career? So uh, I guess it's not unsurprising that the results were 80% yes and 20% no. So um, interesting to statistics. I think we all feel... Uh, the unsettling nature of where we are right now. But, um, you know, we are making progress. And uh, this idea of getting people back to collaboration is what we're all about. So thank you uh, for all of your time today and your questions. And sorry we couldn't get to all of them, but uh, we will try and answer more questions in the chat as we see them. So thank you. Um, I want to send out a, a great thank you to everyone uh, who's been involved today, and especially to our team here, Gary Radburn and Matt Allard at Dell, who sponsored the event along with Rick Champagne from NVIDIA, Michael Mansouri and the team from Meetmo, uh, especially Christian uh, Poe and Johan Romero. And a, a very special thanks to Damian Petro and his brave new media team, uh, as well as our friends at the PGA, the VES and the ASC. So next week, I hope you'll uh, tune in to join us again with another conversation, this time exploring where the migration to cloud for content creation is going to be during this time. And we'll have colleagues from Discovery, Packet Fabric, Google, and Amazon. So please join us then. Thank you, and have a great week. <laughs>